We're going to study in detail one particular conformal mapping between these two sets. So the half space given by the set of complex numbers whose imaginary part is bigger than zero, and the disk, the unit disk, which is just a ball of radius one around zero. Yeah. And we started to do this a little bit. So this is these are the mappings we are going to study. And then G of Z. Okay. And they are examples of Mobius transforms or fractional linear transforms, which is a topic we will study quite a bit going forward. Okay, so what did we show last time? So we showed that if F sends the half space into the disk um, and G sends the disk into the half space, and they are indeed inverses to each other, so G composed with F is the identity. Yeah. Then from this, F is indeed mapping exactly the half space into the di uh, onto the disk. So it's a bijection onto the disk. I'm going to write it like this. Okay, and for the same reasons, G of the disk is the half space. So the half space and the disk are conformally equivalent via these mappings. Okay. All right, so how should we show this? Well, we're first going to show that F is actually mapping to some stuff inside the disk. Okay, so the image of F is going to be contained inside the disk. Okay, so this is F of the half space. And then vice versa, we're going to show that, we're well, not vice versa, but then going the other direction, we're going to show that G of the disk is inside the upper half space. And um, so that will show these two things. And then we'll show, show this, and then that's everything we need. So let's start by showing that this particular fact right here. So, uh, so let me... Underline this, calls this thing star. We start with star. And we just look at the coefficients of our mapping. So if we look at f of z, by definition it is this thing, i of z over i plus z, and Z is in the, we're mapping from the upper half space. Here is I and here is minus I. And the distance from Z to I, right, no matter what point we have in the upper half space, the distance from Z to I is going to be less than the distance from Z to minus I. Yeah, just a, a clear geometrically true fact. Yeah. So when we take the absolute values of this thing, I don't need to rewrite anything. So <laughs> this thing is less than or equal to one, and therefore we are indeed mapping into the disk. Yeah? Cool. So that one was easy enough. So shows. So this establishes. Star. Okay, next guy. We want to show that the disk is being sent into the upper half place by our mapping G. It's a bit more complicated, but let's do it. So let's give that a name. Let's call that thing star star. So for star star, let's take uh, 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 Z inside belonging to the disk and consider our mapping given by this thing G 
GFZ is A of 1 minus, uh, let's call it W just to be consistent, over this thing, 1 plus W. And what we want is to show that it's in the upper half space, which means the imaginary part of this thing is, is positive. Yeah? So the imaginary part of this thing is positive, we're all set. So um, if we say this thing is like this, then what do we have? So we have I of U minus U plus IV like this. No, that's wrong, minus IV like this. And then this is uh, this plus u plus iv. Uh, let's put, let's multiply by the complex conjugate of this so that we just have a real number on the bottom. So let's have u plus 1 minus iv over u plus 1 minus iv. And then on the bottom, we're just going to get the absolute value of this complex number, right? Uh, squared, right? Because z, z bar is mod z squared, right? So if we do that, what happens? So we are going to have a of this stuff here. Now let's do this in a smart way because what we care about is the imaginary part. So, so okay, to avoid rewriting too much stuff, let's just call this thing star, star, star. So uh, from star, 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 the imaginary part of G of Z is going to be the imaginary part of this thing here. The bottom is just going to be a, a real number. So we want to extract the imaginary part of the top thing here, right? And so what does that mean? So that means we want to extract the real part when we multiply these complex numbers together. Yeah, because the bottom is going to be real, right? So if we extract the real part when we multiply these complex numbers together, that will be the imaginary part of this. Yeah, you see what I mean? So on the bottom, we have just the absolute value of this thing squared. So it's 1 plus u squared plus v squared. And then we extract the real part of this. So we're going to have the real part times the real part. So it'll be 1 minus u. 1 plus u, and then the imaginary part times the imaginary part. Yeah? Yeah? So we're going to have this thing times this thing, so it's going to be minus uh, v squared. Okay? And that thing is the imaginary part of the overall expression. Yeah? That thing is this thing. So the imaginary part of the thing in the in the blue box is this thing down here. Everybody happy with this? Cool. All right. So then we can clean up the expression. So then this is the difference of two squares. So this is one minus u squared, and now we have minus v squared. And on the bottom we have uh, this thing. Uh, uh, do I want to mess around with that thing? Yeah, I mean, I don't care about this thing, so I'm just leaving it as it is, because all I need is that this is positive, and I do see that it is positive, because the bottom is just some positive number, right, because of squaring stuff, and this thing right here is positive, because both, because our original W is inside the disk, so the absolute value of W is less than 1, so U squared plus V squared is less than 1, so this thing is indeed positive. Yep. Cool. All right. So that shows exactly this thing that we wanted to show that we're mapping from the disk into this half space. So it shows star star. Cool. So we've got this, we've got this. So once we establish this, then we've got everything we need that we are, that, that F is a conformal mapping exactly taking the half space onto the disk. And the same for G, it's sending the disk onto the half space. So let's just compose these mappings. Good to do this in the right order. Let's do it F composed with G. 
So F composed with G of W, that is going to be I minus G of W, I plus G of W, like this. And that's a complicated expression, but let's do it. So that's I minus Okay, the obvious thing is to multiply top and bottom by 1 plus w. So we're going to have i of 1 plus w minus i of 1 minus w. Like this. And then we're going to have i of 1 plus w. And then we're going to have plus i of 1 minus w. And then let's see what cancellations we have. So we're going to have the i's will cancel on the top. And we're going to have we're going to have an i w plus another i w, so we're going to have two i w here on the top. On the bottom, we are going to have the i's will add. We'll have just two i here, and then this i w cancels with this minus i w from here. So that is that is all we get at the bottom. And sure enough, that is w. So these things are inverses to each other. Yeah. Cool. All right. So we've established everything. And indeed, we have that these things are, are, kind of, are, are, are conformally mapping these completely different sets, a circle onto a half space and back. Okay. And let's raise the ball. I'm going to look at this even, even more closely. Okay. Let's put up our mappings again. So we have f of z is this i minus c over i plus c and this g of uh, w, let's call it w. Is equal to i of one minus w, one plus w, like this. Okay, so f is sending into the disk. So it's sending this thing into a ball. Sent it around zero. Yeah. And it's doing this in a bijective way. So we'd expect the boundary to be mapped to the boundary, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's see what happens. Let's take any real number, which is the boundary of this half space here. So let x belong into the real numbers. And then let's look at what happens when we do this. And as typical, when we have uh, something like this, a nice thing to do is to make the bottom just a real number so that we see the structure more easy, sort of to multiply this by the conjugate. So let's multiply it by x minus i over x minus i like this. And then the bottom is just going to become 1 plus x squared like this. And as we multiply the top, what we get, let's extract the real part. So we're going to have a minus x squared. And then we're going to have a minus i, so a plus one, right? So it's minus i times i, so that's plus one. And then the imaginary part, what we're going to have, we are going to have a plus uh, xi and another. So we're going to have two xi here. Right, and let's break up this into the uh, real and imaginary parts. So let's write this as 1 minus x squared over 1 plus x squared. And let's write this as so over i 1 plus x squared. Okay, yeah, yeah. This is good. All right, so let's think about what happens. So we're on the real line right here. Yeah. So if we start at zero, where are we sending zero with, with this mapping f? Mm -hmm. So zero is being sent to one. So this is we're sending the disk on zero, right? So one is right here. This is one. So zero is being sent to one. Okay. 
Now, let's go forward with positive real numbers towards infinity. Yeah? So what is happening as we take some x, which is positive here, and we map it with, with this thing? What do you see happening? Let's imagine x is very, very big. If x is very, very big, if x tends towards positive infinity, what is happening here? So we write down what we know. So we know that f of 0 is equal to 1. What about the limit as x tends to positive infinity f of x? What is that tending towards? Someone else. Just look at the expression here. You're just taking a limit, right? Louder? Say it again. Negative 1, yeah? This is just negative 1 because as x tends to infinity, the limit of this thing is just going to be negative 1. As x tends to infinity, this thing just vanishes, yeah? yeah? So if we look at what is happening, so let's say this is like, uh, so I'll express this. Say so this thing is like infinity over here, and infinity is being mapped to minus one here, right? Yeah. And as we let x increase, right? So at zero, it's just one. As we let it increase, then what is happening to this expression? It is it is going to decrease, right? It's going to ultimately hit zero, and then it's going to get negative, you know, and uh, it's going to get more and more, more and more close to minus one as this dominant thing on top and bottom will be this x squared top and bottom. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know? So we see that. Imagine the path of x as we move along. We start here, right? Yeah, and we are decreasing, ultimately becoming negative, and ultimately ending at minus one. Yeah. You know? Yeah? So we're going in a steady way this direction. Yeah? Yeah? And what's happening to this thing as we let x increase? Yeah? Well, as we let in x increase, well, it start off at zero, right? As we let in x increase, this thing becomes positive. Yeah? Becomes positive. Um, it's going to get positive, more and more positive. But as we keep increasing x, then the bottom thing will start to dominate the top thing and it will start to decrease, right? This expression will decrease, right? Yeah. So the imaginary part will start at zero, will increase and then decrease. And as we go towards infinity, it decreases all the way down to zero. Yeah? Yeah? So what we see is that the path that x takes as it goes from zero to infinity is indeed tracing around here, the upper half of this circle ending around here. Yeah, you can just we can just see it from the formulae. So this is what happens as we go along from zero towards infinity. We are tracing around the upper half of the circle like this, like this. Yeah, cool. And we do the same thing as we go from zero to negative infinity. So uh, we start with zero at one, right? And as we go to negative infinity, what's the limit of this thing? What's the limit? as x goes to negative infinity. What's this? Someone else. What is this? Yeah, it's also negative 1, right? Again, because this thing vanishes and this thing doesn't notice if you're positive or negative, so this limit is just going to be minus 1 again. Huh? Cool. So if we look more closely what happens to the coordinates, well, as x goes from 0 towards negative infinity, this thing is decreasing, right? This is things decreasing initially, you know? Until x gets large enough and the bottom starts to dominate the top and then it starts to increase again and ultimately as we go towards negative infinity, this thing will vanish. Yeah? So the i-coordinate starts by going down and then starts to go up again. Yeah? And this coordinate as x goes towards uh, uh, negative infinity, this thing steadily decreases as well because, because, the app, because it's x squared, so as whether we go to positive or negative infinity, it's not going to change this in any way. It's still going to gradually decrease as x increases, and ultimately it's going to tend to uh, minus 1. Cool. So as we go in this direction, then we are tracing around this thing, like this. Yeah, 
And just to emphasize it, this is where we are sending f of infinity. And if we think a little bit more about it, this guy is indeed just a meromorphic function, right? It's a meromorphic function, yeah? In fact, it's a meromorphic function on the extended complex plane um, because we have a removable singularity at infinity. Yeah? We have a removable singularity at infinity, and that removable singularity is just the value minus one. Yeah? So infinity has a unique, unique value. Yeah? We have a unique value of infinity for f of infinity. Therefore, it's, it's meaningful to treat this uh, as a point on the extended complex plane, and that point is being sent to minus one. Yeah? Cool. So, what is this thing doing? This thing is, is, you know, I mean, this is, the fact that this exists is kind of, uh, it's kind of, uh, uh, surprising because this is doing all of this weird stuff in an angle preserving way. So if we drew some grid lines like this, like going off to infinity, like this, then the image of these grid lines, obviously they're very different. They are, they are, they are no longer going straight lines, but, but at all of these intersection points, they will, they will all cross at 90 degrees because these angles will be preserved, right? So what is this thing doing? It's kind of taking this thing and then wrapping it all around like it's taking the half space and kind of wrapping it all around into, into, into a circle. Yeah. Uh, onto, onto a circle, onto its side. So when I'm doing this, then, then also imagine me doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is, you know, I mean, there's lots of software packages that show examples of conformal mappings, but, uh, yeah, but it's hard to draw. So it's, like, it's kind of like, all of these grid lines are like getting finer and finer and finer and finer like this. And yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't really draw it. But, uh, but, but we're fitting all these, all these, this infinite collection of squares all inside this, inside this circle. And they're all bunching up like here, really, really small. You know? And we're managing to do this while preserving angles, you know? which is pretty, which is pretty strange, it's pretty extraordinary. You know? But these mappings actually exist. These mappings actually exist, I mean, we've just seen them. Right? I mean, not actually, it's not actually hard to show that this thing is angle preserving. We did this right at the start. Yeah? So, um, yeah, these, these, are, these are powerfully strange mappings.